through verse 12 of the second chapter. So Mark 1, beginning at verse 35. And our subject is Jesus travels throughout Galilee. There are parallel accounts to this in Matthew 4 and 8, as well as Luke 4 and 5. Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse 35. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there prayed. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. And he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him and kneeling down to him and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and said unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed. And he straightly charged him and forthwith sent him away. And saith unto him, See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way. Show thyself to the priests, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for testimony unto them. But he went out and began to publish it much, and to blaze abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but was without in desert places. And they came to him <coughs> in every quarter. And again he entered into Capernaum after some days. It was noised that he was in the house. And straightway there many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. There were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why did this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your heart? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed, and walk. <coughs> but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. This is in Mark 1 and Mark 2 that we read. As we said before, John gives a lot of the early elements of Christ's ministry and the synoptic gospels will leave that out and they deal more with the, the middle and end of his ministry. So here we're only in the end of Mark chapter 1 the beginning of chapter 2 but we're, we've already covered a lot of ground much of which was in John. This is still early in Christ's ministry and we know uh, before this, he had twice gone to Jerusalem. Once he had cleansed the temple, and a second time at what's referred to as the unknown feast, a feast that is designated in the Gospels. At that second uh, time in Jerusalem, we know that Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath, and he told him to take up his bed and walk. And he also made himself equal to God. And he had stirred up the wrath of the Jews, which is a generic term for um, the religious leaders 
of the Jews. What we need to be aware of is that Jesus intentionally precipitated conflict with the religious leaders. And why would he do that? Remember, Jesus came to die for our sins. He knew exactly how that would happen. So he, he really began by drawing them out and drawing the lines of demarcation very, very clearly. He made his claims very clear to them early on. Before he even called the disciples, we, we see that they wanted to kill Jesus for being a Sabbath desecrator and a blasphemer. So he had drawn a line in the sand. And this is how it had to be. Jesus got to the heart of the matter. We're told that there's no other name given amongst men whereby we must be saved. The re religious leaders from the beginning focused on Jesus. It wasn't that religious group of disciples. They wanted Jesus, and they know Jesus was the problem to them. Jesus was now being watched. And the comments we are going to see here regarding the miracles reflect that organized opposition. In politics, we call them talking points. Always draw the, converse, the political conversation to what you want to focus on in a campaign. <coughs> Criticisms of your opponent or what you want your campaign to be about. In this case, it's really the criticisms of Jesus. Very early, they had established blasphemy. And uh, they were going to continue with that charge of blasphemy. And the same position of the Jews is going to be set forth here, as we saw earlier, of the healing of the man at the pool of Bethesda. After those confrontations in Jerusalem, the disciples of Jesus were told, baptize more than John. And so Jesus was gaining in popularity. His name was going throughout Israel. Jesus had preached even to the Samaritans and received a very favorable response. He had healed the nobleman's son. And between the miracles he did in Jerusalem and now a uh, miracle in Galilee, we're told the fame of him went around. And that was just the beginning of it. In our last lesson, we talked about one Sabbath day in Capernaum, where Jesus began by casting out a demon. Then he healed Peter's mother-in-law. And then we found that the, the people from the entire town of Capernaum, which was a good-sized, it was the commercial center of Galilee, uh, were crowding around Jesus, and he touched every one of them, and he healed all of their diseases. So that was the, that's, that Sabbath day in Capernaum was quite a scene. And we're told that the, the, the fame of him, the rumor of him, the buzz about him, the, the talk about Jesus went all over Galilee. And it was a favorable reception by and large, other than the reaction he had had to the religious leaders in Jerusalem, it was favorable. Then there was also his hometown of Nazareth, which we said was sort of a microcosm of the nation. They wanted miracles, they, they wanted what they could get out of Jesus, but they didn't want to receive him for who he was. Um, and, and when he went to Nazareth, they were willing to listen to him, but he said, all you really want is a miracle. And he said, I'm not going to perform a miracle for you. And they got so angry they wanted to kill him. Realistically, we can understand why they had trouble believing in Jesus in Nazareth. He'd grown up there. Later we see the comment of, you know, his sisters still live here. And so, it, it was difficult for the people of Nazareth to believe that Jesus wasn't just one of them. It was hard for them to accept him because he wasn't even trained as a, as a rabbi. Well, they ended up by wanting to kill him. But to most of Galilee, this period was one of non-stop miracles. Most of them were healings. 
And this was a great contrast with the, the priests and the scribes and the rabbis. Jesus actually helped their needs. He fixed them. He actually solved their, their personal needs. He didn't just teach them. which He did that. But if they had needs, He fixed them. And the healings of Jesus are really um, to illustrate the fact that He can heal our sin sickness as well. But Jesus knew the problem of miracles. He said, except ye see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Edersheim noted that the human reliance on miracles was really part of Jesus' humiliation. His own creatures could not see who he was. All they could understand was the difference between natural and supernatural. <coughs> So Jesus would show them that. But he had to mix that in with the teachings about what else was supernatural about Jesus. What he had really come to do for them. It wasn't just to heal this person's illness or that person's illness. The real purpose he came was to fix man's moral sickness. (coughs) Well, after this night of non-stop miracles where it says Jesus had put his hands on all of them. It says he rose up very early before light and left Capernaum. Now he goes out to pray. After some time, Peter, and we're told there were others with him, went out to look for him. They said, all men seek for thee. Well, naturally all men were seeking for him. He had just healed people right and left. And when that word got out, there were even going to be more people coming from all over to uh, be healed. Jesus said, I have to preach beyond Capernaum. She says, I want to go into the next towns. The word used for next towns is the only time this word for towns is used uh, in the New Testament. Uh, it means small, unwalled towns. And we're told Jesus preached in the, in, in the synagogues. So a town had to be of some size, usually ten families, um, it, to form its own synagogue. So he, but he said, I have to go to these little towns too. These little communities... Uh, as well. And he preached in their synagogues. And we're told he preached throughout Galilee, preaching and casting out demons. There are only two specific instances are given of the, his extensive work at this time. Uh, and one is really after his return to Galilee. So there's only one miracle in this time, time when he went throughout all Galilee. And these are chosen for a reason because they tell us something about Christ's message. The miracles were chosen because they were given to us by the Gospel writer to illustrate the person and power of Jesus. The first one was when he cleansed a leper. Nobody claimed to be able to cure leprosy. It was... It was something that had been around, you know, we see it early in the Old Testament. In Moses' day, it was a long-standing problem. No one thought a cure for leprosy was possible, at least not by human means. Sometimes people got better from leprosy, but generally, leprosy was for life. And then we're also told that he forgave a man for his sins. This is after he returned to Capernaum. And he healed a man who is desperate for the grace of Jesus. Mark chapter 4 gives us a few additional bits of information on this extensive Galilean trip for which we're only given one healing. Matthew tells us that the influence of Jesus and the excitement about Jesus had spread far and wide. It was not only all of Galilee, but in Syria... He says, people from Jerusalem, Decapolis, 
and Judea and east of Jordan came to see Jesus. So Jesus was quite the celebrity. People were desperate to come see him. And of all that period of time, one miracle is recorded. And only one. But it's an important miracle because it's a miracle nobody would have believed if they hadn't seen it. And that was the cure of leprosy. Because leprosy was the dreaded disease of that period of time. There were laws for the identification identification and quarantining of lepers in Leviticus 13 and 14. The priests were given instructions on how to identify leprosy. The person suspected of leprosy had to be taken outside the camp and isolated from others. Um, which is interesting expression outside the camp because we see that expression repeated uh, elsewhere in scripture. Uh, the sacrifices uh, included things that were the opal. Some of the thing uh, when an animal was sacrificed, only parts of it were sacrificed on the altar, but other parts, like the, the <coughs> opal and such, were taken outside the camp and burned. And this was a place where you didn't um, you know, corrupt the temple by disposing of them there. You took them outside the camp. <clears throat> We're also told that uh, Jesus suffered outside the camp. And then we're told in Hebrews 13, 13, let us go unto him outside the camp bearing his reproach. So Jesus was that sacrifice nobody wanted. And he was sacrificed outside the camp. And so we're, we are told to go outside the camp. So the leper ha had to be isolated from others because he was infectious. And the priest would re-examine him every seven days. And apparently from... It's difficult to understand um, Leviticus 13 and 14 because diseases um, mutate and they change it's not entirely clear, and there's been a great debate over the centuries as to exactly what disease leprosy was. And uh, we don't have a disease that acts exactly like this. But it was something where the flesh started to die and turn white. But after a certain progression of the disease, apparently the victim was no longer contagious and no longer in infectious. But still, it was, it was something that, that was disfiguring and it required your, that you, were, uh, you could not go to the temple, you couldn't live inside of a walled city, and you had to declare yourself to be a leper when you met someone even on the road. Uh, this man may have no longer been contagious because he did come somewhat close to, to Jesus, but he probably suffered from an advanced case of the disease. Well, in addition to the laws of Leviticus 13 and 14, the rabbis had created many levels of separation from the leper, completely artificial. And they had all these rules how you had to, to they, had, they would stay clean ceremonially clean by, by staying as far away from leprosy as was possible, sometimes to ridiculous extents. But leprosy isolated you from normal life. You were unclean. You couldn't enter the temple. You couldn't uh, enter a walled city. Now, interestingly enough, the, wall, the, excuse me, the laws regarding leprosy only applied to Israelites. They didn't apply to foreigners. So, the, the problem of leprosy was largely a ceremonial uncleanness, and you were isolated from the temple. It was dreaded because once this happened, there was no known cure. There were provisions for those who regained their health, um, and perhaps there was a certain degree of resistance, so when you were declared to have leprosy, perhaps it didn't progress, it's not entirely clear, but... You had to be declared 
clean by the priests. And this is relevant to our story here. This difficulty that and this lifelong stigma that leprosy provided is why leprosy was so feared. Once you were a leper, you, you were pretty much a leper for life. This is also why leprosy was a good analogy for the pollution of sin. And why the key element of leprosy was you were ceremonially unclean. And the pollution of sin is something that no man can remedy. The rabbinical tradition tried to tie all leprosy to sin on the part of the leper. That's never said to be the case. <coughs> in scripture that next to touching the dead leprosy was the most feared type of ceremonial uncleanness so rabbis spoke of um, their personal behavior and how they dealt out with leprosy and one, one rabbi said he would throw stones at lepers to chase them away and felt justified obviously in doing that another said he would not eat an egg that was sold on a street where a leper lived. Now, in contrast to that, notice the response of Jesus. The leper bowed down before him and said, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Jesus touched the leper, something nobody did. Nobody touched the leper. It was stupid to, to, to touch a leper because you wanted to stay as far away from that disease as you possibly could. And then Jesus said, I will be thou clean. The uncleanness that he undid was the ceremonial uncleanness that had separated him from the worship of God. It wasn't just a healing of leprosy, but he actually made him clean. This is why he told him to go see the priest. Now much has been said about the injunction of Jesus to the leper. Jesus said, tell no man. And to, honestly, I don't know how important really it is to, to, to try to you know, figure out why he said that. In fact, he's sometimes this story is referred to as the uh, disobedient leper. Jesus told him not to talk to any man, say nothing to any man, but to show himself to the priest. The contrast was reporting the miracle or first showing himself to the priest. It's not even clear whether Jesus was intending him never to speak of the miracle. Because uh, obviously God didn't have any problem with uh, the gospel writers reporting the miracle. What Jesus told him to do first is more, more significant. And that's the point here. Jesus specifically said, go show yourself to the priests. The reason for this, it was the law of God. In Leviticus 13 and 14. And Jesus said, this will be a testimony to them. That is, to the priests. See, the confrontation had begun when Jesus cleansed the temple. And Jesus, we're told, knew the reports going to Jerusalem that Jesus was now more popular than John. Jesus had drawn the wrath of the Jews for advocating what they called Sabbath desecration. Then Jesus was called by these same uh, religious leaders a blasphemer for making himself equal to God. And they, they wanted him killed. So Jesus said, I want you to do this as a witness to the priests. That, go to the priests and make them examine you carefully. Because they have to declare that you are no longer a leper and that you are clean enough to go into the temple. Okay? Now this is, he's, he's basically saying, I want you to go to the people and at least some of the priests wanted him dead. And they were circulating this charge of blasphemy, which is going to reoccur here now in Galilee. So obviously this accusation is out there floating like a talking point against Jesus. Oh, you know that Jesus, he's a blasphemer because we've heard what he said in Jerusalem. But he said, go to the priests, I want this to be a witness to them. 
So Jesus is particularly saying, I want that priest to examine you carefully and he will have to declare you clean because he will not find any leprosy on you at all. And then, another reason why Jesus told him to do this is because um, the Levitical law required that the leper had to give an offering. And depending upon how much money he had, if he was very poor, it was a very nominal offering. But he had to give some sort of an offering of thanksgiving. Well, Luke says the man so publicized this miracle that great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. In verse 45 of our text, Mark notes that Jesus could not even go into the city. So people came out to him, out into the country, and were coming from every direction to be healed by Jesus. But that one miracle is the only one that's recorded. So you see what was happening with Jesus is everybody was convinced he had supernatural power. Uh, and, and as much as at times Jesus withdrew from people because he said, I don't want them just here for the miracles. But at, at least the people were coming to Jesus as someone certainly of God with supernatural power. In, in verse 1 of chapter 2, we're told he entered into the city of Capernaum after some days. That expression after some days means an interval of some time. So the, the trip through Galilee where he preached in, in many synagogues was an extended trip. And there were a lot of healings. And we're only told about the leper. And the crowds descended upon him in Capernaum once again. <clears throat> he was teaching in a house. We're not told, it's sometimes presumed that this was likely Peter's house. Luke says that Pharisees were there and doctors of the law with his scribes. They come from throughout Galilee and Judea to hear Jesus. Now, some of those Pharisees and doctors of the law, scribes, were probably critical of him. Some were, may have been there, particularly the ones from Jerusalem had probably been told, maybe you need to go see this Jesus Go find him and see what he's saying. They already said we want to kill him because he's a blasphemer. So now we see some of those same religious leaders going to Jesus way up in Galilee. They went out of their way to go follow him and, and report on him. And sure enough, they're going to be the ones who criticize. <coughs> now, Jesus is going to tell these religious leaders, the same thing he had after the healing of the man at the pool of Bethesda, that it caused this desire to have him killed. Jesus is going to repeat a miracle, a similar miracle, really a, a, a leper would have been considered an even greater miracle because it represented not just sickness but uncleanness. And then he would used the same words that he had used by the pool of Bethesda, rise, take up thy bed and walk. You see, that's what he had told the man at the pool of Bethesda that started the anger of the Jewish religious leaders because it was a Sabbath day and Jesus told them to, to take up his bed and walk. And as we've said, there was no law against carrying something on the Sabbath. That was a pharisaical rule. Jesus also said, the Son of Man had power on earth to forgive sins. And back in the discussion with the Jewish religious leaders at, around, after the pool of Bethesda incident, he said, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life. So here he's returned to Capernaum with all these people crowded into a house, including probably some not friendly to him, he taught them. Now, this is, in Sunday school lessons, you might have seen, or in a you know, picture book of Bible stories, you might have seen a picture of people literally disassembling a, a roof and the roofing tiles and, 
and such. That's likely not what they did. It would think about it. It would have been virtually impossible to take off and at the actual roof of the structure without some heavy things falling on the people below. Now, that brings us to you know what what exactly what did this picture look like of this man being lowered down? If this was Peter's house we know that it would have been big enough for Peter and his wife and Peter's mother-in-law and very likely a place for Jesus. Additionally, we know that fishing could be a lucrative business. It was a big business in, in, in Israel and the Sea of Galilee was the center. Capernaum was right there. Peter and his family uh, were in the fishing business. Peter could have had a large house. And a large crowd would have best been accommodated in a courtyard. And so it's very likely that um, this was several rooms around a central courtyard. And people you went out of each little apartment through a courtyard. And Jesus may have been teaching in the courtyard. And perhaps some honored guests were inside, may have been inside one of the rooms, and Jesus was teaching at the doorway. But there was limited access here, and once people had all crowded in, there was a limited doorway to get into the house, and so there's no way they could get this, this <coughs> poor man in. Especially, four men were carrying the man. And just getting him through a doorway would have been difficult, but with the crowds, they thought that was, that was impossible. Well, the, the four men were carrying this man who had the palsy. Palsy is a generic term for several kinds of paralysis. Again, it's difficult to establish a, a medical definition of what was wrong with him, but the limbs were typically withered and contorted into unnatural positions. And when you read a description like that, it sounds something like a, an advanced case of rheumatoid <coughs> arthritis, which literally disfigures and causes contortions. There are other things, too, that can cause this, and, and the limbs are sometimes distorted in, in, um, in, in very awkward, unnatural positions. Well, since they couldn't go through the door, they decided to go up on the roof to get closer to Jesus. And there's two ways that could have happened. Sometimes houses had outside staircases to go up uh, onto the roof. Or there's an, uh, an expression of the road of the roofs where the house is interconnected. So if they got access in any way on a neighboring house, they could have gone over the roofs from house to house. And this is in a town, the houses could have been uh, up against each other, sharing walls. <clears throat> Once they got up on the roof, they went over towards this courtyard, moving the lightweight uh, shade canopy over the cart courtyard would have been relatively easy. Now, at that point, everyone knew that Jesus was a healer. And we can imagine that the people closest to Jesus at ground level would have known the intent of what, exactly what these men were trying to do and they would have helped lower the man down. And Matthew says the first words of Jesus to the man was, Son, be of good cheer. Well, now, some forms of palsy made speech impossible. You could, this man obviously could not walk on his own. He may not have been able to talk. You can imagine the distress to a weak man of being jostled by four men, taken on a roof, and then lowered down by people on the ground trying to reach up to help lower him down. And he must have been in some real state of stress. So Jesus basically says, you're going to be fine. And Jesus then says something 
somewhat unexpected. The people were expecting a healing. Jesus said, "Thy son, thy sins be for thy, thy sins be forgiven thee." We can't, we can't penetrate the mind of Jesus. Uh, but he was going to use this statement as a means to chastise the Pharisees. But we cannot assume it was for their benefit alone. Perhaps he wanted to understand, he, he wanted the people present to understand the moral aspect of his miracles. Jesus could heal the sick. He could even cleanse a leper. But more than that, he could make the leper clean, even by the close inspection of the priest. Jesus didn't want crowds whose only desire was to see the supernatural made common. Jesus came for a higher calling than to be a doctor. He came to heal man's sin sickness. So he first of all said something that would have been obviously controversial. He said, thy sins be forgiven thee. And we can assume at that point that was done. But nobody could see sins be for, being forgiven. It produces no outward results, really, that were visible to anyone there. Jesus may have wanted to refocus the attention of all present on, on this claim that he could forgive sins. So he said something that they would have found a little hard to believe. And sure enough, the Pharisees and the scribes, some of whom were told were, came from Judea and Jerusalem specifically, they responded that this was a blasphemous claim. And perhaps because the same claim was made in Jerusalem, uh, they were identifying the exact claim that they were sent from Jerusalem to verify. Yet he's still at it. He's still claiming things that belong to God only. So they raised this as a point of theology. At this point, Jesus was performing so many miracles that they may, may have not have wanted to go after Jesus personally. They said, you know, we have a point of theology here and nobody can object to our objection. So they said, who can forgive sins but God only? Which is true. And they, they were saying this amongst themselves, or at least thinking it. Jesus perceived what was in their hearts, and he asked them why they reasoned so in their hearts. And Jesus said, which is easier for you to believe? Is it easier for you to believe I can forgive sins or I can heal this man and have him walk out of here? Well, obviously the forgiveness of sins was harder because I couldn't see it. And their theology told them that you shouldn't say that. <clears throat> but he, Jesus knew that if he had this paralyzed man get up and carry his bed out of there, they couldn't deny that, that that happened. They could see that, you see. So he said, so you can understand the first thing, that I can forgive sins. I'm going to show you the second thing. I'm going to heal this man right before your eyes. They would impugn and deny the first, but they wouldn't be able to deny the second. Then Jesus said to the man, Arise and take up thy bed and walk. This is exactly what he had said to the man by the pool of Bethesda. You see? And these Pharisees and scribes are thinking just that. Yep. He's doing it again. As soon as Jesus spoke the words, the man who had been carried in by four men stood up, he picked up his bed, and he walked out under his own power. And Matthew said he did exactly what Jesus told him to do. He departed to his own house. The people in the house were told glorified God. Mark says 
they said, we never saw it on this fashion. Matthew has them saying, they glorified God which had given such power to men. Luke says, they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. This witness isn't said just to be of those that were already friendly to Jesus and were looking for a miracle. The people who were there because they heard Jesus was a miracle worker, they would have had no trouble believing that. It doesn't say that, you know, this, that the scribes and Pharisees who had just criticized Jesus and said, you shouldn't say that. Uh, it doesn't say that they were still skeptics. They couldn't be a skeptic when they saw the healing. So Jesus, in effect, shut them out. Ultimately, this attitude from the religious leaders was going to lead to Christ's death. Ultimately, enough of them got together and said, we don't care if he can perform miracles. Because it was af even after he raised Lazarus from the dead, their response was, pretty soon everyone will believe in him. And... There, so we have to kill him. That's when the conspiracy really began in earnest. The, so these scribes and Pharisees from Jerusalem could repeat the same charge of blasphemy, but they couldn't deny that a miracle had taken place. No man could see forgiveness. So they were going to challenge Jesus' ability to forgive sin. But all present saw the twisted limbs of the man strengthen and straighten. They saw him do what Jesus commanded him by enabling him to walk out under his own power. They said, who can forgive sins but God only? And Jesus agreed with them. But he could not show them forgiveness of sins. So he would show them a physical healing and say that it was an illustration of the forgiveness of sins being granted. <clears throat> Jesus can heal spiritually and physically. This is why he first said thy sins are forgiven thee. He wanted them to be skeptical that he had actually forgiven the man's sins. They wanted him to the, he wanted them to object to that so he could show them that uh, another miracle that would prove that the first had already taken place. The outward cure was a revelation of the reality of the more significant inward cure, the cure for the sickness of sin. Let's pray. Our most good and gracious God and Heavenly Father, we pray.